and we'll see at this point, uh, just from this screen, if I'm getting to the second screen, because my topic today is marriages, many kinds of them, and it's it's at the top of, and it, it just gives you the bare glimmer of a lot of kinds of sources. We've already gone into and talked before about what you do with a particular kind of cer uh, certificate. In my last talk, we talked about death certificates and the depth that you could go to with them and what you should do to record all of the information, the questions you need to look at. So uh, even if you're joining me for the first time today, you're gonna get another chance to do that with a marriage record. It'll be really quick, but it gives you the idea of uh, all of the kinds of questions you should be asking, at least based on the certificate or the small piece of information you're seeing and what you should do next. So it looks like, yes, my screen went forward. If you, I'm, I'm gonna talk about United States uh, records first of all today, but I'm gonna tell you that in general, the things that I have to say about marriage certificates and about marriages and types of marriages and places to go for information actually apply across the globe. We're going to be more familiar maybe uh, with European uh, or with uh, things in Australia, New Zealand, but it applies in many of the same ways. If we look at South Africa, for instance, or if we look at Asian, uh, the, the continent of Asia and look at marriages, informal and formal, and we have to change our minds about what formal or informal also means. But if you don't know the state, uh, and I had a question early on today before you all came on about where to find that information uh, for Kentucky, uh, then you can go right out to familysearch.org and it has a fantastic place for you here to get right into and begin to estimate marriage information and understand it's just a first place. It's not gonna give you all of the information. It's just gonna give you some clues. But if you'll notice, they have things there virtually for every place. You'll even be able to go on another slide, which I'm not showing here. You'll be able to go further and look at US territories, uh, look at uh, dip, uh, marriages uh, conducted in uh, diplomatic places like uh, uh, working in Russia and actually having a marriage, for instance, take place uh, within the U.S. embassy there or whatever. I mean, it, you can go that deep so that you can begin to find records. Oh, Family Search again, I'm giving it to you right here, it has a tree, a, a free wiki, I should say, where you can find the basic state information. What you're going to do is call up familysearch.org, make sure that you've uh, signed in. Uh, if you don't know how to sign in, they will show you how. Uh, it's an easy thing. This is a free site where there's lots of information, but up at the top under search, you're going to find this thing where you can uh, pull down menu where you can pull down to their wiki. And it is fantastic. So if I were looking at Montana, which I've pulled up here today, where could I find marriage records? Well, it even gives me a hot link here. That hot link is signaled by that line underneath that blue set called Montana Marriage Collections, 1850s to the 2000s. And it'll give you the list of collections there that you can go to. In other words, it takes you more in depth. So if you do that, and you still don't find it, then you can go back and try another thing called Montana County Marriage Records at Ancestry. Uh, and you may be able to find that there, but we're all aware that at that site, that costs money. So you may not have that. I can tell you pretty well that the state stuff, if you're looking deep enough in Family Search, you should be able to find it there. Just giving you a quick reminder again that marriage records for a United States county begin when that county is created. So get that creation date, Google it. You can go out and actually Google it at uh, a U.S. wiki and there, the information is pretty good. Remember to check the source down at the bottom, but you can do that 
and look at its online site for a brief history to find out when it was created and when they really began to look at their records. They're going to begin all of their records on that date. So I always take the time to put that in my family timeline where I ever am so that I'm reminded and I don't have to say again. Now, tell me again, when did uh, Oregon Territory start uh, with their uh creation of their data within the territory, as opposed to Oregon as a US state and so on. Remember, it's specific to the type of uh, thing that has happened or occurred for them. So again, just like I did with records for uh, people who are deceased last time, I gave you a set of questions to ask that you should be anticipating. It's kind of a, what we would call in reading circles, we would call it an anticipatory set that says, okay, I'm prepared. I'm going to get that marriage record. But if I don't just want to be guilty, as we all are, of doing Snoopy's happy dance, then I need to do more about those questions. I need to have in mind what all is there, not just, yay, they got married, but what was the county? or the place of the marriage and the date of the marriage, you wanna get that down. If you're saying, oh yeah, Jan, I know I can, I can do that later. Uh, sometimes later never comes after we do the happy dance. Just telling you. What about the age of the bride and the groom? On that particular document, is there a precise date or a place of birth? Now I want you to remember something here. I'm talking deliberately about marriage records. There's a difference between a marriage license and the marriage certificate. People will say, I want the really fluffy one, you know, the really pretty uh, document that says that they got married and here's the certificate. Believe me, you want both. Frequently on that license or permission to marry, you're going to find that age of the bride and groom. Uh, you might find their place of birth you might find their full names. Uh, my uncle Archie, I always called him Archie, uh, but I was not aware that his first name was John. You might look to see if the bride's maiden name is there, or is there a clue when you look down at the parents that the bride might have been previously married? the residence of both of those people on the day of marriage. Did she come in from someplace else? Did he come in from someplace else? Will they be going back to that particular place? What were their occupations? Is that listed? For some states, it is. Is there a divorce that's referenced for either party? Uh, the names and the birthplaces of parents of both parties, is that there? In the license, you might expect to find it. And finally, on either form, you are on the actual uh, birth, uh, certificate, marriage certificate, you might find probably the names of the witnesses. That's really important. Are they relatives? Are they friends? Are they, you know, how are they uh, linked to that married couple? And the name of the church or the minister or the priest or the justice of peace. Justice of peace is just as important there because if you're looking for another record of who performed a marriage frequently, a JP will keep his or her own accounting book of those marriages of who they married. And so that's another place to look for an informal piece of evidence of that marriage. In fact, it's not too informal. If they were licensed at that time, then it is the formal record if you can't find anything else. Now, the first thing you're going to do, I'm going to ask you to do is come down from cloud nine and write the summary, including all the information you found. This is your opportunity right at this point to make maximal use of your expectations of questions. You know, that anticipatory set of questions that I gave you. And getting the maximal information that you're going to put into your brain about these people. This is your best opportunity. When you put pencil to paper, 
and you do a brief summary for yourself that you're going to put in. You can put it, let me see, in your family timeline. You can take all the information and put it into each person's record. You have many more chances to put that into your brain permanently. And then you can use that information you found because you're going to be able to bounce more questions off of each piece of information as you put it in into each participant's file. So that means even being able to create something there that says, oh, did you look at it? Auntie Jody was one of the witnesses to that marriage. So you're going to go over to Auntie Jody's file, wherever that is, if it's a paper file or if it's a file that you're uh, working with on a program uh, like Roots Magic or something like that, or even if, heaven forbid, you're out there at Ancestry and you put the information back in, not recommended, but I know many of you do that, then you've got a better chance of adding to that person's uh, whole file. With practice, I get this done in about 40 minutes. Uh, and because I spend time at the beginning uh, writing it out and summary is key. And I'll even do something that um, you can do, I guess. You can add in other information so long as you get the essential information down. Duplicate that summary in each person's record and in your family timeline. You've got more places to look then when you're trying to remember what happened on that date. So oh, here's an example of a license summary that I did. This is my dad. Byron R. Lee, this is what I wrote. He was 23, born at Haver, Montana, because I found that on the license. Son of Oscar L. and Mary H. Nanik Lee. Nanik was my grandma's maiden name, and I found that. Now, what I put in here that I didn't find was I put, I thought, hey, I'm very smart here. All of Haver in Hill County, Montana. Well, that wasn't really necessary to be in there because that wasn't on the record, but I'm guilty. I put it in. And then Inez Genevieve Beck, who was my mom, 22, born at Kenmare, North Dakota, daughter of Engvald and Ella May Bennett. Yeah, I got my grandma's maiden name, Beck. And then authorized by Evelyn M. Boyle, Deputy Church Clerk of Court in Hill County, Montana, and the date that that was done, even if it wasn't their, their marriage date. Because notice what I did here was the summary of the marriage license, not the summary of the actual marriage itself. And I'm, I gave you that as one thing today, but I would have... And somewhere in my records, I've got that thing that says, okay, this is what actually happened. Actually, it was uh, a pretty cool thing uh, to see who was there as the witnesses because they were not family members, but they were close family friends. Then go check and see what information was asked to get on the form. Add it in. You can draw lines, you can draw arrows, you can do all kinds of things if you're not interested in writing out that neat particular thing or typing it out, but you need to summarize. Where should I put this information in my genealogy records or where should you put it in yours? Well, record that marriage, all aspects. That means both the license, if you've got it, and the certificate in both of the parties' individual files. So... The parent files, they are recorded as having a kid being married on that date. The witness files, and by the way, Roots of Magic 9 gives you the opportunity to put those witness files in, even if they are not relatives. You can give them a separate file, and that's a very, very cool thing, especially when you're considering lifetime uh, friendships, which they were for my folks. Then I record it in my family timeline, and I note everybody in there. I don't say I'm going to go back and do that because I'm famous, just like you. I won't. I need to do it now. I note that whether it was a church or a civil ceremony, and I check out the records for the church or the minister to see if they have another record. For example, if I find out that that church, uh, that that was a church wedding in the 
Lutheran church, I'm going to promptly go out online and see if I can't find the church record too, because it's going to be out there. It is available to you. While it is at Ancestry, you will also find much of that out at uh, Family Search, and occasionally you'll find it locally. So it's pretty cool. I add in everything. It just helps me to remember. Now, here's, you know, for those of us who are using timelines, I create a timeline paper and pencil just using Word. Uh, and I've also, you know, shown people how to use other kinds of free uh, services out online by Google Docs or whatever. You can do that. But here's also the advantage of things like uh, Roots Magic 9. I happen to use that one, but there are at least five others that I know of that all do this. It's a genealogy database. And the minute that I put in a piece of information about my grandpa, Engvall Beck, who lived from 1880 to 1970, it makes it into his personal timeline. And that means that I can go and I can actually cut and paste that timeline if I want to elsewhere. I had also, if you notice up at the top, it says show relative events, everything that's in there, like the birth of my mom, the marriage of his sibling, uh, Clara, they're all in there. And I have the option to check or uncheck that to make uh, one timeline that's just a summary of one person or a constant family timeline too. Uh, by the way, he called himself Granddad Inky Binky to all of us, and we just called him Granddad. He was a pretty cool guy. And I was very privileged to have him in my life until I was in my 20s. So if I don't have his file check that says show relative events, then it shows fewer things, but it will show the important things in his life that I have managed to document. And emphasis on document, if you're looking over at the far right side, then what you're seeing is you're seeing that little pen print there on the far right, that indicates that I've put a source in for it. So that when I run documents out, it's gonna tell me what the source was. Moving on, there are many types of marriage records and I wanna show you something that you should not ignore. Frequently you won't find the actual marriage record if you're going back before about 1840 uh, and you're looking in counties because there was no requirement in that county to actually record those marriages at that point. But you can look for notices of intention to marry in various kinds of document. There are at least four of these and they're pretty universal by the way across the world. So a marriage ban or an intention is noted officially across several weeks. We're real familiar with these when you look at the United Kingdom, like England, Ireland, Wales, in the early United States, also uh, in certain European, uh, Western European uh, countries, and also in some Eastern, there will be marriage bans. In the Scandinavian countries, there will be marriage bans. Uh, and there'll be a public announcement of an intended marriage several times in the weeks before the ceremony. And the church records do exist. And that's one thing you could find. That is, folks, evidence of the marriage. If you can find the third one uh, and then uh, you, you can maybe assume that that is there. Frequently, by the way, if you find the third marriage ban, you can look in the documents for that week for that church, and you will also find the marriage. A separate kind is a marriage intention. It's an intention to marry. And it might be a written announcement posted in a public place by a minister or a town clerk. In colonial New England in the 16th and 17th and into the early 18th, and beginning 19th centuries, you will find these in town records up to it within colonial times anyway, you will find them to the time that they made the decision to become a state because frequently within New England, the town records were also, get this, the official church records. Woohoo! You can find bands published in English parish records across three weeks. Here's one for James Beckett, bachelor, 
and Mary Ann Dowland, spinster. Uh, and it is it is an accumulation. This is a summary in a church record of the number of times that those bans were published. Now, understand, churches had some latitude. They could announce it vocally, and they could announce it written, or they could do both. You need to look to see what happened. It looks like they were announced, but it says, look at this, were published on the three Sundays. So in some way, maybe on the front of the church or whatever, it was published. It would have been a separate register reserved just for this purchase, this purpose. I believe I found this one out at Find My Past, but I'd, I'd have to look back to see because it's been many, many, many years. A married bond is another type as an intent to marry. They ensured in advance that the forthcoming marriage would be legal. There were no impediments like the groom having been married before, like the bride having been married before, or people not having permission to marry if that particular state or that particular province uh, required that. It was literally a written guarantee and a promise of pavement payment by the groom or a bride's relative if something hinky went on and it was disproven later. The bond was actually presented to the minister, there's a nice clue, who then performed the marriage and he filed the bond with the county or the local clerk, or if it was within a church, it was filed there. So they are very different. You will find these commonly when you look out at the Canadian archives, uh, they have some of the best examples that I've seen. And if, if you're fortunate enough to have people married in those early years in upper or low, lower Canada, you can look for those marriage bonds. They'll be very brief, but they will state. Uh, frequently, you're going to find that it's the brother of the bride or the dad of the bride, or you're going to find it's the groom or the groom's parents or whatever, but you will find those. And, you know, I've had people say, well, Jan, which one should I get? Should I get the marriage bond? Should I get this? Get them all and put them in order within your timeline. They add a great deal and they're going to help you to write your family's story. Here's a marriage bond example, uh, that of Daniel McKinnon, bachelor, and Miss Elizabeth Mackey. This is from my husband's family uh, in archives and it's available here I'm showing you uh, there and I I don't know if I put this into your notes or not but it's really easy just to go to uh, uh, Canada archives and you'll be able to find these things right away they are very very uh, front and center and what it will say that the condition of this obligation is such that they have obtained a license of marriage. He's gotten one for, for himself and for his wife that uh, if it doesn't appear that this happened later on, like uh, there was some kind of another pre-contract that precluded this one, or there was a consanguinity issue involved or something, uh, it tells you a little bit about the rules even for that particular community or that particular colony or state or place at that time. That's valuable information for your family. Sometimes you may only find that. If it is, then that's what you have. But believe me, in your summary, you, you write in every single document that you tried to look for. And you said, having only found the marriage bond and then evidence of this husband and wife living together later, it is assumed that the marriage was completed. Not the greatest information, but way better than nothing. Note the signatures. This was Daniel McKinnon, the groom, who signed up at the top, and then Thomas Mackey, who was the bride's rep. And then there were two more witnesses for you to look at. Uh, there was a Donald Frazier and a Thomas Douglas, I believe. He's got a really hinky S, but it's an S, I believe. So you can talk about contracts and settlements as evidence of marriage, uh, and you'll find these in legal ads, and frequently people say, well, that only happens when you've got somebody who's really rich, or maybe they were royalty or whatever. 
No, you're going to find these a little more commonly than you would think because they were created as a means to protect certain property rights and usually the bride's legal rights. Remember, in most places, and they were even probably more liberal in other countries than what we settled on once we became a country, women could own property in the United States, but unless a contract or a settlement was made previous to the marriage, then according to a state's laws or colonial laws, she could have given up her property rights to her husband once they were married. If, however, prior to that marriage, there was a contract and a settlement signed by a family with evidence that said someone else, uh, that someone else had given her things and they were her property and could not be uh, considered to be her husband's property, then that was an issue that became part of the marriage. You might even see evidence of a dower right as proof of the marriage where you can't find anything else and you're saying, but she's mentioned in a dower right in a will, I don't have anything else, then that's evidence of marriage. You might have uh, what we have commonly in Montana, and you might want to go look for these. They are women and sole traders journals. We have ours here in Cascade County. In fact, I have one right in this room where there was, we call it a prenup, a prenuptial kind of thing where they were recorded by women stating what would always be theirs. Remember again, women didn't have a lot of rights. For instance, they didn't have voting rights before about 1920. They didn't have rights to lots of things very naturally. And so you wanna look back to see what people held out and said would be theirs. There's a really neat list that we have with one woman where she patiently, but in, in great detail, recorded her horses and their brands as evidence that they belong to her. And by the way, so did the plow. The best article I can find for you is a really neat one out at familysearch.org. Uh, it has information about a simple bond of money on the death of the husband, what's guaranteed to the wife, no matter what from that husband, so that someone else in his family can't take that particular thing. Uh, the evidence of a dowry and what that consisted of a dowry of one thirds where she, no matter what, by the law of Pennsylvania or the law of another state, got actually, even though it was not mentioned, a dowry of one third, at least for her lifetime, a trustee guaranteed money or a strict settlement that said, nope, this is hers and this is his. In Great Falls, Montana, if you think that dowers weren't still in effect for a long time. I, as late as 1958, found possible claim of a dower still in effect when I looked at a legal ad in the Great Falls Leader, June 6, 1958. I've found these also, by the way, in newspapers in Helena and in Butte, where within it does claim that, that she could have a possible claim of dower, even that late. So look. Sometimes when you look at wills and probates, it's a puzzle as to a woman, as to why a woman got something in particular where you cannot see evidence and you need to look at the laws and what was still in effect. Well, we come last to licenses and applications to marry, those things that we really hope to get. And, you know, as we know, primarily they began in the 20th century. They are a civil record filed within the county clerk responsible for the record. Uh, and so you have to look from state to state to see which county clerk is responsible. Uh, the county clerk of court in Montana is responsible. So you can find that particular record. And again, that license or application is a separate document from the actual marriage certificate. So you want to get both of those. If you're only able, when you're looking out online, to get the certificate, and that frequently happens, I will tell you, at Family Search, then you want to go beyond that where possible and seek out that license or application. Uh, it's very, very uh, hard 
to think that you wouldn't get that license or application when it would add so much to your family history. Uh, when I got the license and application and then the certificate for my grandfather, uh, Oscar Lee and his wife, Mary Nanik, I found something wonderful there. I had never known his, his mom's actual maiden name and I found her maiden name there. So that was very cool to me. The license is gonna differ from an application. An application may include even more information depending on the state laws. There are some states that ask lots of questions. Uh, so you're going to have to go back to that place again that I showed you at Family Search to be able to look for that state's information. Remember, the license would be presented to the minister or the judge who would marry the couple, and then the certificate would be filed. Here's an example uh, of one of my uncles, uh, Francis Charles Heron of Haver, Montana. He was 24. Uh, in 1928, uh, born at Haver. See, that told where he'd been born, even though I would know that he was born when Haver was Shoto County. Uh, uh, not previously married, son of George E. Heron and Catherine Courtney. Now, that was a really valuable thing for me to get because I had no idea. I thought she was Kate, and I didn't know her last name. So that was a very, very neat thing to be able to get. And he married my aunt, Mary Louise Lee, age 22, da, 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 uh, and uh, that was done. That's the license. By the way, getting the license, if I hadn't gotten the actual certificate, I would think they were married within that district court by a JP, but they weren't. They went to the Catholic Church, and they were married. You can look at consent papers as evidence of marriage. If the bride or the groom were too young to marry, According to state laws like ours, the consent of a parent may be likely be demanded and it will probably be filed somewhere. In our records here in Cascade County, I found them in the books that were actually, they are duplicate records that are kept by the court and I would find them just loose filed in between the pages. There were some hilarious ones where somebody said, hey, you know, dear, dear clerk of court, if my son comes in to marry, if my son Harry comes in to marry, do not let him marry uh, as I have not given my consent. And, you know, you'll find it and you'll find, find it next frequently to the marriage certificate because it was too late. By then, the horse had gotten out of the gate. When you look at marriage certificates as evidence, of course, just like everything I've shown you today, they are gold. The clerk of court copy is available when you cannot find the original uh, document that it may be available. And we are very fortunate in Montana, as are many other states, that these records have been copied and are available free to you out at FamilySearch.org. So you don't have to, I mean, you will also find them, I'll tell you, at Ancestry. Not all of them, but you'll find them there. But you're paying for that one j just by having your your uh, particular subscription there. So there is a way for you to get that for free. Then remember, there's another state copy sent by the county to vital records for that state. And usually this will be just a little, you, you could put on a four by six card. And it's just a summary of the information. It's not a copy again of that particular license. It's not a copy of uh, the particular certificate, but it will tell you usually the parent names. So it's worth getting. I would get all of them. There may be a minister's copy, which you might have because they were given to the newly wedded couple. And it may be different depending on that church's rules for a copy or for the things they put in their certificate. Be aware of it. It can be a copy in the personal journal kept by an official. At least there may be an entry noting the couple and the date and the time. This is frequently what we call the JP or the Justice of the Peace co copy. And some of them keep them, some of them don't. There are no rules that they have to keep them. But usually they want to keep track of what they've done. Here's a marriage certificate actually for uh, 
Frances Heron and Mary Louise Lee getting married, showing who their witnesses were. Friends again, they were not family members, uh, at, but it was by a minister within the Catholic Church. Uh, and so there it is. Now, I happen to have uh, access to the copy from St. Jude's Church in in uh, Havert. So there's a different, again, record for this particular marriage. I'm just saying, get all you can. And there might be a prettier certificate still available. If you're like our county, we actually right here in our library, in the Great Falls Genealogy Society Library, have those early certificates up through 1967 plus the marriage books. Here's an example of a state of uh, a state marriage certificate. Again, just giving you just the facts, ma'am. And that's pretty well it. When the license was issued, what the date of the marriage was, when it finally got forwarded, uh, who, who did it. This one will give you all the information if that's all you're, you're used to or that you would like. Uh, but uh, it's a pretty neat record too. You might find evidence of a marriage when you can't find it elsewhere in early, early American records or in England or in Australia or New Zealand or Ireland or whatever. You may find it as, as evidenced in a will or later in a probate record because when you're considering the people that are written into the will or written uh, and noted in the probate record, they may state the precise marriage relationship for that wife, for that daughter, for that son, or that granddaughter, or that particular person that they have considered important enough to be in their will or in the probate record after they have died. For example, and to my daughter, Mary Knowlton, wife of John Knowlton, I leave my favorite horse, Chester. So there is evidence, folks, that that person was married. Or, and to my wife, Andrea Smithson Knowlton, I leave all of my household goods. She may live in our home until death, unless she remarries. There's the remarry. You've got the fact that he called her his wife and that he says that she might remarry and that's another thing again sometimes it's the only record you may have but it's a golden golden record the probate may also allude to a natural child by the way and to a now acknowledged right of that child so for instance you may see something say and to my natural children hetty ambrose and delilah green I give each $50 payable from my estate after, and it's actually after all bills are paid, but those are the things, acknowledging some natural children uh, with two separate surnames. We don't know at that point uh, if that was their maiden name that had been taken or their married name, I leave that to you. Here's another example. And to my only son, Josiah, son of Letitia, I give all of my farm animals and 20 acres in the lower section of my property here in blank county. So he's acknowledging another child, son of Letitia, tells you who the mom is, may not tell you her last name, but there is an acknowledgement of a certain right. You might find it in a sense, census evidence of a marriage, especially after 1860, when the US census has started putting that information in. I'd start looking for that earlier in European countries and in the United Kingdom because they put in evidence of the marriage within their certificates much earlier than that. But in the United States, for instance, you can look at a US census in June of 1900 in Butte, Silverbow County, Montana. And here's Richard and Katie Carney and their children. And right there, it's gonna tell you, let me see, it's gonna give you the months of their birth, the year of their birth, their marriage evidence. The head of household has the wife named as a 
wife, look at that column, that's valuable because at least it's claimed to the census taker, the number of children living, the places of birth, the man's occupation and so on. So censuses remember are gonna give you a lot of information that even if you were seeking what you would call better information like a marriage certificate, folks, this is evidence. And it's one of the things that should be there. I've had people say, how many, what, what's good enough, Jan? How many records do I have to have for a marriage? Uh, I don't know if these folks are hoping to get away with just one or none or whatever, but I would say if you find it as evidence, put that evidence into your file and you will have multiple pieces of evidence of that marriage and the more, the better. Sometimes that's, by the way, going to take care of some family stories or family things that go on. Well, when I gave you the invitation for this particular talk today, I talked about those rascals who went elsewhere to get married. And there was a very famous thing called Gretna Green in Scotland, very famous for its weddings, because in the United Kingdom, the Clandestine Marriages Act of 1753 said that couples under the age of Mary could not marry in England or Wales without their parents' consent. But it was still legal over in Scotland to marry without that. So they began crossing the border into Scotland to marry. I, yeah, they were absconding with a bride or whatever going over there. If a parent of a person under the age of 21 objected to the minor's marriage, they could legally veto the union. Uh, the act tightened the requirements for marrying in England and Wales, but it still didn't apply in Scotland where it was possible for boys to get married at 14 and girls at 12. Just telling you, but frequently you will see these in what I call, uh, okay, the, the romance type novels or whatever, uh, where you'll see that people have taken off for, for Gretna Green uh, and to go get married and there's a chase scene involved or whatever. This is a little more about Gretna Green. Maybe you'll want to read a little more about it later. We have Gretna Greens in the United States. And this map that I'm showing you shows some known Gretna Greens, uh, not telling you precisely what populations they serve, but these were pretty popular. In Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh had some of its own rules early on. Uh, and so people went there. Uh, as they did also to Berks County. And in Virginia from uh, 1838 actually to 1841, they've got the time timing wrong there, at Fredericksburg, that was another neat place to go. So there were places that you, you could go across county lines. And yes, we had our own in Montana. And certainly by the way, this map, which I got uh, by looking out at familysearch.org. It, it's not the only ones. These are the famous ones. In the West, we know about Reno. We know about Las Vegas. We know about going across various county lines. Uh, ah, the romance of all of that. Notice up there in Idaho. Uh, so we're looking at Coeur d'Alene there, I think. The Gretna marriage came to mean, in English common law, it came to mean that a marriage transacted in a jurisdiction that was not the residence of the parties being married, uh, uh, that's what it was. But the marriage was just as complete because by then they completed other things within that marriage, and so the folks said, oh, heck. So they were legally married. But now you know what a Gretna Green marriage means or what we use commonly in the United States, you know, that elopement. So what's fun about Gretna Green? Well, the Scottish law allowed, allowed for some really irregular marriages. By the way, the Scottish law being what it was, that irregular marriage, you should look for many other except, exceptions to United Kingdom rules when you look at Scottish law. Uh, because they they really, truly did have very different rules. And almost anybody, by the way, had the authority to conduct the marriage ceremony. So the big thing about Gretna Green was that the blacksmiths in Gretna took it upon themselves to do the marriages. 
And there was a very famous one, Richard Renison, who performed 5,147 of those types of marriages. So you will see sometimes just that, that little anvil uh, sign close to uh, a family marriage. And that's a hint for you to go look and see, did they elope? Because it's come to mean more than just that Gretna Green wedding. Montana's identified Gretna Green site is Coeur d'Alene in Kootenay County, Idaho. Well, promptly when you look at that, uh, I did the good thing and put it into my county because that's by the way, where my sister got married. Uh, the county was established in December 22, 1864, named after the Kootenay tribe, but the county didn't really become organized with rules and regulations for 17 more years. Uh, but my sister got married in 1960, so not to sweat. But even in those early years, people said, how'd they get to Coeur d'Alene? I don't get it. You know, did they ride their buckboard? That would have been my my husband's cousin, Chuck. That would have been what he would have thought. Uh, but no, there was a road, there was a highway, and even a railroad, too, early on, even if the highway was just not what we would think of as a highway, but designated as so, and you could get there, there from here. So sometimes even you'll find evidence when you say, well, I can't find evidence of this woman ever being married, but do you think this says what I want it to say? It says they, they got a summons to court and it names James H. Costuris and Nana. I, I, I didn't know, you know if they ever did get married, but it says they are husband and wife. Is that evidence? Well, it's some kind of evidence and it can stand in the place of the other evidence until you find other information. If it stands as the only evidence, then that is what you have. But I encourage you to continue to look beyond that for other kinds of evidence. Remember, when you're looking at any of these, you want to get all the information that you can. Don't convince yourself that you'll come back and do it later. There's too many more genealogy gems to seek out with other people and other things. So do it now. You're going to be surprised. You'll get it down to not too much. And when you're when you are handing your information off to the next generation, or you are handing your generation off to a societal record or to a library or to an archive, they are going to appreciate very much that you have actually described in a summary within your timelines exactly what happened. Otherwise to them, uh, it's all to be reproven again. And you really don't want all your work to go for naught. I'm gonna hype again that there's a book that you can get. I'm hoping that they'll uh, they will update it a little bit, although looking through it, I it would be difficult to see what they would want to update. But I'm going to tell you, you know, right now, it's right before Easter. If you want to give yourself an Easter present so you don't have to wait for your very own Christmas present that you would give yourself, then you want to go look at this book, Family Tree Factbook, The Key Genealogy Tips and Stats for the Busy Researcher by Diane Haddad and the Family Tree Magazine Editors, 2018. We haven't changed things that much, but they will give you a good go across everything in the United States and some things across the rest of the world to get you started. Will there ever be one book that will do everything? No, but until I find another one, uh, this one's a, a pretty good reference to have. Uh, it can just help you a whole bunch if you keep it and hold it very close to what you're doing. And I'll answer any questions that you might have, if I can. Uh, and I'm getting a little feedback again, and I'm assuming, uh, I don't know if others are hearing that, but it's a little feedback from someone. We'll try to deal with it. Uh, there are some questions here, I guess, that were asked, so I can look at those. Uh, so Richard Klinsky says there's a Gretna Green for Iowa, Jackson County, just over the state in uh, Minnesota, for Minnesota and Iowa. Uh, I jumped to the latest. It says, sorry, let's see. Let's go down a little more. In Jackson County, Minnesota, uh, Debbie says, really appreciate it. 
I heard that people could be married in Montana without both persons present, uh, without them being physically present, but on the phone, yes, uh, I do. And I will be doing something on divorce records before the end of the year. Next, we're going to do birth. But yes, you can be married without physical presence if you have established uh, through through witnesses the, the people on the other end of the line are actually who they say they are. That's happened, by the way, with a couple of marriages where a person got called back on to active duty and a marriage had been planned. That's one I know of. So that's a little bit. Anyone else have questions? Randy? I do. Okay. <laughs> um, so... Lately, this is a great topic because lately I've been trying to find uh, some marriage information. One of the records I've found, uh, it, it, it's called a marriage return. Yep. And it looks like it might be like on a five by seven yep. page or card. Um, it's that legal. Has a, has a place for a county clerk to sign it. In this particular case, it's not signed. Uh, but is that something that uh, is filled out at the county clerk's office? It can or be. Or does the minister fill that out? Uh, it can be by either one. But Randy, if the if the if the license and the certificate were taken back uh, to be officially filed, then frequently you may find that marriage return. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yes, it's another neat piece of evidence, isn't it? Right. Yeah. You know, you never know what you're going to find on their occupation or, or whatever that's enlightening. Yeah. Uh, another document, uh, it looks like a list that a county would have sent to the state. It's yep. like a ledger book kind of thing. It lists all the marriages by date for the year. Yep, Oregon um, does that. Okay. Uh, in this particular case, it was in Michigan. Uh, and it was just a real treasure trove because it listed witnesses. Yeah. Uh, witnesses happened to have the same last name as my second great grandmother, who was the bride. Uh, and it lists that they were originally from New York, which allowed me to find the census records in New York for the family. Um, of course, it opens up more questions yeah. because my second great grandmother, apparently from census after census was born in Kansas. Uh, and when I look at the timeline, the family was living in New York. She was born in Kansas, and then she's back in New York a few years later. So it's a big question, like, well, why did they go to Kansas? Yeah. Uh, and then eventually to Michigan. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the occupations, um, it'd be my third great grandfather was a shoemaker in New York. And other, other documents, or whatever, list that. The son, which was the same name as it, he was Albert Jr., was also a shoemaker. So you can kind of track the occupations when you find Albert Jacobs Jr. that was a shoemaker. You kind of know yeah, it's the same family. Yeah. The additional anyway, it just, it's, been, it's been very interesting. So far, these are things I've found, um, you know, family search and whatever, uh, without having to pay the uh clerk of the county to look things up for me but that's that's the next step and we you. hope they just they just keep doing more records we hope anyone else Dodie? where would you look for a marriage that occurred at a military fort when montana was still a territory uh you're going to you're still going to look at territorial records and you could also look at the official day book records for that military fort if they are available. Generally, some of those uh, may be available when you look at unit histories and you're gonna have to go out to uh, the actual uh, NARA to see what is available under those military records. I've also found military records, however, 
under the National Park Service. But look for uh, the records because frequently the day book, which was, you know, what they wrote in for whatever happened at the fort that day, <laughs> records that at least as, you know, uh, Lieutenant Efforts married, sorry, I'm using someone's name here, uh, married Susan, whatever, that particular day. So it's another type of record that you can look for. But generally, you might also look for the religion record for that particular service or whatever. In the West, we had uh, many Methodist uh, ministers that served and uh, frequently they had that, they had a fort within their assignment. So just another place to look, but you might also look for the original, the, the local Catholic church, uh, any kind of church, because frankly, here's, here's the deal folks. Even if you say, oh, well, they were Baptist. They would never have gone to such and such place to be married. I'm telling you, yes, they would have. <laughs> yeah, they would. They would do that. Uh, and so it's an anomaly. That's true within your family history. But if they wanted to get married, they wanted to get married. Nancy? No, I, I asked my questions already. Okay. Uh, anyone else? So, Jan, what are they doing now, um, you know, for future genealogists that are now people can get married by anyone. Um, yeah. They go on the Internet and uh, I don't know if they pull down a license. Do those get recorded in the county? Are not they... always, not always. But Karen, one of the things, you know, let's talk about common law marriage. Uh, because uh, I've I have alluded to it before in a, a joking way. Uh, common law marriage is it, it is a marriage where people declare that they are married on a certain date or as of a certain date or whatever, uh, and that could be registered not with the county uh, the county clerk of court, but with the county clerk just the county clerk. And as I've said before, and we'll go over it in divorce records later on, you, you can't get divorced that same way, but you sure can get married that same way. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to have to look for evidence in other records, Karen. You're going to have to look uh, in wills. You're going to have to look in uh, even, I've, I have seen before in an inventory where a person died intestate, meaning they did not have a will, but there was enough there that they, had to at least establish establish what the property was and who had the right to it, you will see it there. Okay. You will see evidence of marriage there or what people say they are. So yeah, I, I see today that uh, people are marrying and uh, you're gonna have to look. I, I'm not aware of which marriage you're alluding to, but that sounded very interesting, Karen. <laughs> Well, it's just so it. I, I've known for it to happen um, this day and age, where a dear friend or an uncle uh, marries the couple, and yeah, yeah uh, with no training. I mean, he's yeah. just a friend, like I said, or an uncle or whatnot. And I, and I just wonder how is that recorded then? Well, let me tell you something interesting in Montana. You can become JP for a day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call it. My daughter's first marriage was done by her, uh, her uh, one, the, the guy who, abs who instructed uh, martial arts. And he was also a lawyer and he became a JP for a day. He had to get the thing. He had to be officially there. But you also know people could go out there and get officially documented as a minister. And so the record is still there. By the way, my daughter's record, she still had to go get a license. She still had to go uh, do those particular things. So it's still recorded. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Peggy wants to say something here. They don't know they're not married. So 
then then it's hoops to go through. So it is, it is going to be a problem. So did y'all hear that? Not well. No. Uh, Peggy, come over here. Okay. Peggy says, uh, and, and Peggy has worked within uh, counties in Minnesota, and she says, Minnesota has a real problem with people actually uh, getting married uh, with someone else and not filing the document. In Minnesota, they had 90 days to file that document, and after that, the license or whatever they did is null and void, and they don't realize it. She said, hey, you know, for people who had a $20,000 uh, marriage ceremony that can be uh, <laughs> a very interesting thing. Yeah, and she says it happened a lot. Ooh. They they just didn't know. They just didn't know. Peggy says, "Hey, you know, ignorance is not bliss." She right. didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> read the fine print, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Read the fine print. Too true. Oh my! Anyone else? Thank you so much for today. It's been very enlightening, as well, always. Well, you know, there's a, there is a handout. If you haven't already gotten it, it will be coming to you because I sent out uh, the handout to Mary in Helena. For those who are in uh, the Great Falls purview, I think I have sent it to most people who should be getting it here. So you would already have that particular thing. It's five pages of my notes. You're welcome to them. Spread them with joy. They're all written over. Yeah. <laughs> More like this. That's good. That's good, Jan. So uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and if you find more information about other kinds of marriages, tell me. This has been fascinating. And Can I, I ask was... another question? Sure, Randy. <laughs> um, I've seen in the documents where the age, it says legal. For the bride i'm assuming maybe she didn't want to disclose her actual age but just was saying that i am of legal age is that correct yes and randy for instance in montana you can look back to the original marriage laws or, or who's legally married in montana and there will be i can't remember if it's a footnote to the marriage uh or if it's in the actual law but one or the other place uh, i found evidence of that particular fact uh, actually discussed by legislature before that partic particular new part of the law was passed. And so it's as there is part of it. And that's, it's quote, very legal to do. Interesting. Thank you. Thank all you very much for the session. Sure. All they have to do ever was prove that they were of the first legal age, 21 or 18 or whatever, or that 14 and 12 back there in scotland's heyday oh, dear. So, so i will see you next week then and we will discuss those wonderful wonderful things uh on baptismal records and things you didn't know that you need to know about baptism and birth records and i will see you next week and this will be available about next by next wednesday or so hopefully cheryl will be able to post this uh, out at YouTube, and you're welcome to utilize it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Jan. You. You're welcome. Good job. See you next week. Yeah. All right.